Aloha mai kako. You are watching Hawaii Political Reporter. Aloha, and thank you for watching Hawaii Political Reporter. On tonight's show, we will have next week continue our interview with Professor Todd Bell. But if you really want to dig into the policy information of what people plan to do, you got to go out and talk to them. If you really want to know what the candidates have in mind, go talk to them. Uh, go meet them at these forums. Like I said, we've had more forums this past election cycle than I, I can ever remember in the past 10 years that I've been here. And I think, uh, I think sometimes the duty is of the voter to go educate themselves. Yeah, and I'd like to add yeah. two things to that. Really, please, I beg you. I mean, if you really want to know what's going on, you got to get specific with them. You got to ask mm -hmm. them specifics. And I'm trying right. to slowly get to that. And a lot of times, honestly, the candidates themselves, especially if they don't have, and I'm just going to be prejudicial here and I'll say it, they don't have science degrees, okay, or they can't do the numbers and they can't, they can't analyze this thing. It's BS, okay, because you get to the numbers, just look at the numbers and get through it, because that is what's critical, at least down to an order of magnitude. And you will find, like, I'll just tell you frankly, I listened at a whole day at Pahoa to probably at least 30 different candidates, 25, 30 different candidates. And I, and I know something about alternative energy, and I found only two out of all of those had a clue of what was going on. The rest of it was BS, and these are the guys who are gonna be making decisions for us. Mm -hmm. So I would say, if you're really serious about any issue, ask the specifics and try to get to the numbers, and you're gonna fluster them, okay? But I hope for all of our benefits that they start mm -hmm. to look at this, because man, especially numbers coming on in this country, we have got serious number problems happening, okay? Well, there's nothing wrong with trying to fluster candidates every once in a <laughs> while. Uh, they're gonna come up against issues that they don't foresee when they're in office. And uh, sometimes, you know, it's important to be able to ask them those questions uh, when they're campaigning. Oftentimes, candidates find themselves repeating the same thing over and over because they, they go door to door, to door, they're calling people, they're at the forums and stuff like that. Uh, it's good to, to ask very pointed questions sometimes of them when you get the opportunity to do so. Of giving course, them, respectfully. Giving them a chance, yeah, okay, yeah. and maybe they can come mm -hmm. back. And, you know, on the, along mm -hmm. on that point, you're saying that they're going to keep repeating the same thing. I actually heard from a candidate today, and it, this is true too, that they keep getting asked the same thing. That's, okay? yeah. So, I mean, you know, we have a duty too, okay, mm -hmm. to help them, okay, by making intelligent questions and thinking about right. it, okay? I mean, that's helpful too, because, mm -hmm. I mean, you can't blame them for wanting, trying to provide what's being asked, but at the same time, you know, if you're asking a better question, mm -hmm. you may get a better answer. Yeah. And ask, ask them what's really important to you not just what you hear people talking yeah. about, uh, your friends and neighbors, or what you see in the newspaper as being an important issue. Ask them what they're gonna do for you, particularly on the issue that you care about, or cluster of issues that great you care about. Great point, really yeah. great point. Mm -hmm. So I guess that goes back to the involvement. Now, is there sure. something in your class, I mean, on a generic basis, how would you guys, I mean, you could do this, obviously, since it's political science, okay? Mm -hmm. Obviously, you would imagine there's some scientific methodology involved with this, oh, okay? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But for the novice out here, you know, the average person, how would you go about quantifying? Is there a grid, or how would you go about evalu evaluating? And, of course, I know we all have emotional, so I know I hate to say mm -hmm. this, but some people go by looks, okay? Sure. Some people, oh, I like his voice, whatever it is. And, you know, but how are, do people judge and how might, okay, as a model, how might they look at these candidates? Um, are, you're talking about our local candidates? Yeah, let's see local. Or I if, guess you, we if you want that. to talk about local. Either one. Um, how do I quantify it? Well, if the, the political science scholarship on local elections uh, indicates that um, people are very poorly informed about them. And, and uh, what really matters is what they hear from other people. Mm -hmm. uh, word of mouth makes a huge difference. Uh, in local elections. Also actually having contacted the candidate, uh, that's why going door to door for candidates is very important. Mm -hmm. Having contacted the candidate is very, very important. If people know the name, they're familiar with the name, and if, especially if they've met the candidate, uh, that is something that can um, really boost a candidate's political fortune. And the other thing is endorsements. Uh, a lot of people, again, aren't very knowledgeable, and if they hear mm -hmm. that uh, their union or the Chamber of Commerce that they're involved in, or if their friend's a firefighter and they'll ask them, who are you voting for, and stuff like that. So uh, endorsements mean a big deal in, uh, in these elections as well, because the turnout is pretty low in them as well, which means your vote matters even more in these local elections. The primaries are really what mm -hmm. decides the future, I think, okay? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you one of our, or we'll have it on, it's uh, actually G. Edward Griffin. If you've ever heard of him, you might want to look it up. He's got a video called 
uh, I think it's the collectivist conspiracy or something like that, where he basically goes and makes the point that, you know, what really counts essentially the primaries because by the time the generals are done, you know, the corporate and the, and mm -hmm. I'm not, not against corporate as long as everything's in balance, okay? But the moneyed interests have chosen the candidates, which really means no choice. And of course, we can only let that happen if it's us doing it, right? I mean, what is the well, ratio of involvement? I'm sorry, you're going to make yeah, a comment? If, if I can bring that back to, uh, to our, our island and, and our state, uh, certain areas are, you know, d dominated by one political party or the other. Usually it's the Democrats here, right? Mm, and yes. so it's the Democrat, Democratic primary that matters the most. And this happens all over the country. Uh, the way that... Uh, the way that districts are drawn or, as we say, gerrymandered in order to favor one political party over another, it's really the person who wins in the primary that's going to go on and, and thump the person in the general. So you have to pay attention to that. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's one way that uh, in the South they were able to keep blacks from voting for so long. They, they let them vote in the general but not the primary. And because everything was democratic, they didn't let them vote in the primary. And they were essentially disenfranchised. So you can disenfranchise yourself by not voting in the primary because oftentimes that's the election that makes they a difference. you were not allowed to vote mm -hmm. in the primary? Being they had whites-only primaries in the, Dem in the Democratic parties Until in the when? South. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. that's, uh, I didn't, I heard that there was yeah. some problem with the Democrats previously with minority candidates, but I didn't know mm -hmm. it was that extensive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny how things cycle through. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, I mean, when, you know, we consider mm -hmm. that, you know, Lincoln was the champion of, you know, the black people back then and maybe mm -hmm. Switched around. I'm just curious. In this state, what is the ratio of independents to Democrats? And I, I, I question on, on that right. is, you know, in actual like registration, uh, or how is that determined yeah. actually? In our state, it's not determined, and that's the big problem. Uh, we don't have uh, when you register to vote, you don't have to declare a party in this state, and for that reason, it's very very difficult to know uh, what our our real percentage of Democrats, independents, and Republicans are. It's also very difficult to know from, from the votes because, I mean, most people don't vote independent party. If they're, de if they're indep politically independent, they'll vote either Democratic or Republican. And because we have these primaries that, were, that are uncontested, sometimes if you're a Republican, why even bother voting in one certain area? Mm -hmm. uh, it's also very difficult to look at the uh, election returns to determine uh, what our political uh, party um, balance is. I mean, we're, we're heavily Democratic, we can say that because Democrats win consistently here, and uh, the voter, the voting rates are uh, are much higher for Democrats across the board, precinct to precinct. But if you if you look at, at the large scale, someone like Linda Lingle was able to win twice as a Republican, mm -hmm. as a gubernatorial candidate. So obviously there are some politically independently minded people in this state who are willing to vote uh, for the Republican Party and can be attracted to the Republican Party. Uh, given the right set of issues and given the right candidate. I think, you know, just as a note, I maybe, I gather you were in the state then, wasn't that Linda Lingle mostly getting in was kind of the economy was bad, it, it, honestly, at the time, and it was mm -hmm. their kind of, because, I mean, isn't it unfortunately true? I, I, I swear, I believe a lot of people mm -hmm. pay no attention, they don't care, they don't have anything until just before the election, they say, okay, how are my finances, better, worse, and that's it. Well, you know, uh, in terms of uh, a vote choice, a lot of things make a difference. Let me first reference uh, mm -hmm. the uh, the O2 election, and that is where we had um, a hotly contest contested Democratic primary, right? Uh, ah. Ma uh, Maisie Hirono and Ed Case again, okay. and so that pretty much split up the Democratic Party. Uh, the Democrats were worried that that would happen again between Mufi Hahnemann and Neil Abercrombie in '10, and uh, and they were able to you know bridge the gap and and the Democrats were able to win that election. So uh, a contested primary can weaken that political party mm -hmm. uh, if the other side is united. And so that was a big, a big factor as well. But in terms of predicting vote choice, this is really fun stuff. And there's a number of different uh, models that political scientists use to predict those, those things. And some people make their minds up well in advance. These are your people who are strongly conservative Republicans or strongly liberal Democrats. So They're not going to vote for the other alums. party. Don't sure. They're not going to vote for the other party, no matter what, no matter who it is. As the, as they what used to call them, yellow dog Democrats, right? They're, you know, what is the percentage of that roughly? Do you think? Mm -hmm. I mean, rough in the per voting population. I mean, uh, really of the voting core. population, you're looking at 20 to 30 percent of of, of each, each side of each side. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so they're the people who are going to vote 
uh, I mean, 20 to 30 percent on either side. So we're, you, and so we're, you're looking at uh, a big middle ground okay. uh, of, of voters. And so over the course of the election, uh, I'm sorry, over the course of the campaign, people will decide who to vote for mm -hmm. at different times. Now, you were just saying people will wait until the last minute and decide how the, the economy is doing it. Actually, uh, most of the research indicates that over time, the first thing that people think about is, is the person in the same political party for me, the, okay. uh, of me? Those are the ideologues that we talked about. Okay. Then as you get closer, some of the, what we call the sociological characteristics become more important. Uh, union membership, uh, your uh, socioeconomic status, your um, uh, income levels, these things will really predict your vote. And then as we get closer, uh, the policies become more important. What mm -hmm. people start, for the people who are still, still haven't Especially decided. Especially if there's a grouping mm -hmm. of candidates that are relatively right. similar, I'd imagine. Sure. The fine uh, details become more important. Then, then the policies become important, and then, so more and more people sort themselves out into one camp or the other, and then as we get down to the end where there's that small group that's mm -hmm. left that hasn't decided, as you get closer to the election, they make up their mind based upon the personal characteristics of the candidates. Mm -hmm. Are they trustworthy? Do they provide good leadership? Are they knowledgeable? These types of things. So um, as, the candidate go, as the campaign goes on, different people uh, decide who to vote for at different times, and they have different concerns at different points during the campaign mm -hmm. that are more, import, more or less important at a and given I, time. I guess I, I've seen this myself, actually, something I was involved in, and I think then you also have the good old ground game. You know, mm -hmm. at, at the very end. You oh, know, where, get out the vote, right? Yeah, where mm -hmm. some of them have a good at network and can get those people sitting on the fence who may mm -hmm. or may not vote and get them out, and that's big. Right, especially people who have money to be able to hire the vans and the buses and to get people out to the uh, to the polling place, or if they have really good organization. Um, unions are very good at, at mobilizing people and getting them to the polls on, on the day of. Or and so very that, good, yeah. dedicated believers. Yeah. Or what's becoming more activists. important now is um, absentee balloting mm -hmm. and encouraging people to, to vote absentee. Is, is that mm -hmm. raising the overall participation or are we still declining or what is percentage wise? How's, it's, how are we doing? It's, it's very difficult to say. Uh, one of the things that influences the voter turnout rate is the prestige of the office at the top of the ticket. And if you look back at our recent elections, it's been all over the place. Sometimes we'll have a Senate race, sometimes it'll be a House race, sometimes it'll be a governor's race, then it'll be a president's race, presidential race, and things like that. So it's hard to make the apples to apples comparisons and look at turnout rates. The other thing that matters is the competitiveness of the races. Oh, yeah. if, the, if the top of the ticket races are very competitive, you'll have more people turning and out. And if people are steamed about mm -hmm. something, right? I mean, right. You know, I mean that's so, like they say, something they're going to, like this yeah. professor said, they're going to lose yeah. something and they can mm -hmm. do something about it, maybe. There are a lot of variables that go. In, into turnout, uh, there has been a slight, or a slight growth in turnout mm -hmm. over the past couple years. It is probably explainable by the uh, the quality of the candidates. Barack Obama brought out a lot of people mm -hmm. to vote, a lot of first-time voters and things like that. Uh, the novelty of the election, Pune having its own its own mm -hmm. district finally, and a lot of young people getting out and running for those races. Uh, so it's difficult to say right now uh, on Hawaii Island whether absentee voting is merely taking the place of in-person voting or if it's actually increasing the voter turnout. We need a little bit more data uh, to look at that over time. And it's hard because we just redrew the, drew the districts and now that we're getting good data from the, from the state on the precinct level, we can't really compare it to the past trends because they were in different areas. So it's, uh, it's going to take some time to be able to answer that question. Two relative questions. Okay, One being you mentioned that there's a hardcore group of ideologues basically on both sides Absolutely. that are going to mm -hmm. be fixed no matter what so mm -hmm. that's uh, you know done although if, if their candidate if their party's candidate ignores them too much they, they might may, uh, they may bolt for a third party candidate it does happen well, sometimes i'm one of yeah. them <laughs> i'll tell you that right now i'll admit it okay yeah. but uh the other thing is is they also might not vote Sure. Right? Absolutely. Which is gigantic too. I've yeah. heard that actually from some people, mm -hmm. and they, that's what he, he was telling me that uh, that's mm -hmm. what the blank ballots for. You know, like you know, vote. Mm -hmm. huh? Right. So. And uh, this is this was one of the big concerns for uh, for both Republican nominees in the last two elections. If you look at John McCain and Mitt Romney, uh, the hardcore uh, ideologues were a lot of um, Christian conservatives who didn't mm -hmm. feel that those two candidates uh. really reflected their values. And so each of them has chosen vice presidential running mates 
who, mm -hmm. who have some appeal to those voters to try to win them back so they don't stay home. They actually are energized by the campaign. That's got to be show incredibly up. tough at that level. I mean, it just, I mean, good gosh, just for the whole county to keep everybody mm -hmm. happy and together. I mean, the president, yeah. that's got to be unbelievable, <laughs> the organization sure. and what's going on, the 50 mm -hmm. states. I mean, it must yeah. have a, you know, a whole... You know, thousand of you guys, political scientists. Have, <laughs> I mean, seriously. I mean, when you consider all through the states, what's yeah. got to be happening, and down to each district, mm -hmm. you know, which makes it count. Yeah. We have a lot of fun doing the analysis. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's, great. it's a good time. That. Yeah. So in that ratio, let's say, I mean, how does it roughly boil down? Is it like, let's say, hardcore, thirty percent on each side, and then another mm -hmm. twenty percent soft, but mm -hmm. but usually there. Mm -hmm. Okay, or is that something like that? And what that's, I mean, a, that's about right. How much is really? I think I've heard this, but is it like mm -hmm. ten or fifteen percent really that's pliable in, in the middle? No, uh, it's, it, there's um, about forty percent of Americans consider mm -hmm. themselves politically independent. Mm -hmm. So, so it's the largest group. It's, it's the largest group, but they vote in lower numbers, mm -hmm. yeah. so they're less likely to turn out. So while there is a big potential vote there, you have to activate them. You have to gotcha. get them to the polls. And give them give them a reason mm -hmm. to want to vote for you as well. Uh, these people uh, tend not to vote in every election, and so they they are subject to being drawn in. Uh, they're also subject to be, to dropping out if they don't like either party's candidates, or if they see no difference between the two party candidates, then um, those people may stay home. So it's a it's the largest section. It's the middle. If your candidate can't get it, the other candidate will go after them and try to use them to win. Uh, but getting them out and getting them to vote is really the main thing while maintaining your base. On this county, it's actually pretty diverse. I, I mean, mm -hmm. what, what you're dealing with, I mean, I kind of mm -hmm. looked at this, and I know I think you did some uh, work with the paper. You were, you know, talking about the different sure. districts, mm -hmm. about who went for, I don't know if that, I think that was you, wasn't that I was time? looking more at turnout at that point, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, now, are there trends? To me, it seems like, a lot of people are, I mean, it's always been the case, but maybe it's really becoming in numbers now. A lot of people are coming from California, moving in, mm -hmm. settling in, kind of have their expectations. Uh, Hawaii, to some of them, might seem backwards. Uh, you know, I think some of us have been here long enough, kind of really don't like that. It's just our way. It's how we kind of do things in some ways. But uh, mm -hmm. is this a, a giant, this immigration, so to speak, coming in from California, is this changing the politics here uh, significantly? Uh, I'm sorry, I probably wouldn't be the best person to a ask that question to since I'm a California immigrant. Oh, so from am I. <laughs> I am too. Okay. I, came, I came here in 2003, mm -hmm. so I've, I've been, been here, um, uh, you know, a little over nine years. I'm in my tenth year of living here. That's significant. And, that's enough. You, you know but, uh, no. but, you know, so that's, I don't think I have enough long-term perspective to be able to answer that question. Uh, we, do know, we do know one thing about uh, voting blocks on the Big Island. There are still, you know, pretty important ethnic voting blocks on mm -hmm. the Big Island. And we, we know that there are Filipino also... Filipino or who, which, which... I'm not going to call out names. Okay, <laughs> okay, no, I, but uh, but oh, there okay, are... okay, I think I can, we can okay. imagine. That there are ethnic okay. groups and there are also, uh, there are uh, union groups and chambers mm -hmm. of commerce that, that vote in blocks as well. And uh, the one thing is that uh, instead of having more mainly a Democrat versus Republican uh, split in terms mm -hmm. of who runs. There are um, fractures within the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. generally along uh, the social issues lines. And I'm talking okay. about things like abortion and gay marriage, and those are the things mm -hmm. that really distinguish uh, sort of the two factions within the Democratic Party. Is it kind of like the old working class at the state Democrat level, okay. versus the progressive Democrat, uh, or how would you kind of characterize that? I think that's a good way to put it. Uh, remember, we also, you know, we have uh, a we have a very substantial uh, number of people who are very religious in this mm -hmm. state. We also have a very a substantial number of people who are uh, ex-military in this state. And so we have a, a conservative democratic group and a more liberal progressive democratic group. And, um, and that's what really plays out in our state house. Rather than having Republicans versus Democrats, we have the factions of Democrats. You mentioned something very interesting. Mm -hmm. We were talking earlier, uh, Polsey. Okay, mm -hmm. Tulsi versus Mufi, sure. and what was happening there, and would you give us a little bit of analysis of there, what, what the you know, trends and issues may have been with the, in that race? Well, uh, I, I guess this may, uh, may apply to your earlier comment. Uh, if you look at um, Mufi Hanneman, we have somebody who was in office for quite a long time, in politics for quite a long time, 
um, had this you know ac sterling academic pedigree and, and such and background and experience and uh, had a lot of uh, support on the island of Oahu and in the district he, he was running in the second congressional district that was only about 30% uh, of the district was on Oahu so it didn't really play into his strengths to where he was really strong uh, the biggest growth is going on on the neighbor islands, our island in particular, and so you have a lot of new voters there. And you have a candidate such as Tulsi Gabbard who isn't well known outside of Oahu. And so she had a chance to introduce herself to, uh, to people, whereas Mufi was the known quantity. People liked him or didn't like him because of the last gubernatorial election or, or what they knew of him. Another candidate who's not well known outside of Oahu who had a chance to really determine her personality for voters to really introduce herself to voters uh, for who she was and I probably spoke poorly when I said determine her personality but to tell voters who she was because voters didn't have an idea of who she was up until that point and so with her media campaign and the consultants that she brought in she was able to reach a lot of voters uh, through television and I, I know she did a lot of outreach as well uh, it, but it's a very tough place to run a retail politics uh, campaign. The second uh, congressional district is the neighbor islands in outlying Oahu. Uh, it's hard to be in all those places at once and so it you really have to almost have a, a top-down media heavy saturated campaign in order to win and she had that. So campaign financing that's a big issue oh, yeah. this cycle especially with the Citizens United decision pro yeah. or con. I mean it's definitely changing the landscape. Yes. Uh, what, do you, what do you have to say about that? In terms of uh, campaign finance, uh, as I mentioned, it, it makes a big difference in different races. Uh, when we talked about the House District 2, you got to have money because you, ha you got to have media. You can't be everywhere during that, uh, during that campaign. Some races it means more than others. Some people are able to get elected with just a little bit of money. We have our, um, our publicly funded campaigns on the island of Hawaii. And they seem to work pretty well uh, for some of the uh, county council elections, but as you get uh, you go up uh, the ladder in terms of the uh, the seats that you might run for, then you need more money, and uh, there isn't any campaign finance available, uh, public finance available to those candidates at that level. You got to have more money. You got to get your name out there uh, for people so that they can see you on TV, radio, to see your your stickers and and everything like that. I think we're going to see a very big influx of money in our U.S. Senate race and in our House race, uh, not because I think they're going to be com terribly competitive, uh, but because of the Citizens United decision, which allows for the creation of super PACs. These super PACs are going to be able to spend unlimited amounts of money to um, mostly to oppose uh, rather than to support uh, certain candidates to have an influence on the election. The U.S. Senate uh, looks right now right down the middle. Uh, the Republicans need to pick up three seats to be able to, uh, to bring it even, uh, four seats to be able to take control. And it looks right now all the seats are lining up about 50-50. And there's a couple that are too close to call. And there's one state where an independent uh, is running and hasn't said who he would caucus with. And that's um, uh, Angus King in, in Maine. So because of this, the Senate is going to be the big money battle. We saw how the Senate could stop certain uh, acts of legislation in the Congress just these past few years. Uh, the health reform bill uh, was stalled for quite a long time. Other bills didn't make it through without having Senate support. Because the minority party has so much strength in the Senate with the filibuster rule, you're going to see a lot of people from outside of Hawaii throwing a lot of money at our Senate race, and it's not going to be pretty. And the reason why I say it's not going to be pretty is because these groups, these super PACs, they don't have to be responsible for their message. A candidate has to be responsible for his or her message because they are going to go debate the other candidate. They're going to be interviewed by the media, and they generally won't lie about the other candidate. They, they may stretch the truth a little bit. Sometimes things are taken out of context uh, in terms of politics, but they just don't outright lie, and they just, they're not, they don't go over the top. But these, these uh, super PACs, they don't have to hold office, they don't have to go to the debates, and they don't have to be responsible for what they say. And so one of the unintended consequences of the Citizens United 
decision is that it's giving the political power of speech to people who aren't really running for office and are less responsible with the types of things that they tell us in terms of the amount of education and information that we're going to get in, in this coming campaign. Okay, so there's a large amount of money being injected in here. So where does this right. money go? How do the candidates use it? And how do they get the most bang for their buck now? What are they mm -hmm. doing? Well, it's different when the candidates have the money themselves. We talked a little bit before about getting the biggest bang for the buck in terms of vote getting. Uh, some candidates raise money and they want to make sure that they're spending their money on stuff that's going to translate into votes. And that makes sense up until a certain level when you can start hiring professional staff and then the votes are all that matter because you've got plenty of money. But one of the things that people have been spending their money on lately are these uh, new fantastic databases that are out there. Uh, for the Democrats, it's called Vote Builder, and for the Republicans, it used to be called Voter Vault. It's now called the GOP Data Center. And these are some of the most fantastic software programs you've, you've ever seen. Uh, we're all familiar with Google Maps and things like that and how we can get down to the house level and find out information. Well, with these voter programs, you can get down to the house level and you can sort of mouse over the house and find out who's living in there and whether or not they've been voting in the last few elections. Obviously, you can't tell who they vote for because, uh, you know, that's why we have secret ballots. But um, you know if they've attended certain events from your party. You know if they've ever given money to your party. You know if they've ever... Um, you know, made any sort of contact with the party. So because of these things, uh, the, the campaigns have become much more sophisticated and much more well-targeted. They can send out mailings just to the people that they think they want to get to vote. Now, they're not going to send them to the people who are necessarily the strong voters who always vote for them and will turn out no matter what. They want to spend this money on the people who may be inclined to vote for them but don't vote regularly so that they can grasp that middle that I was talking about before. These are, this is uh, some really fantastic uh, software. With the new 2010 census data, all the data is really fresh, and so there's a lot of ways that campaigns that can have a really strong impact uh, in terms of getting votes and talking to voters directly, independently, even very individual voters, targeting their message and their media to those people to get the biggest bang for their buck. Professor Bell. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here. I, I learned a lot, and I really, really am very appreciative of that. And uh, we appreciate your time. And again, you have a, a continuing course now, at least for f four weeks yeah. coming up in the county. And where can we find out more information about that again? Well, thanks for having me, Ross. I really appreciate being here, and I really appreciate uh, what you do. Uh, with the, uh, the course that I'm offering, it's um, for members of the public. It's through the UH Hilo College of Continuing Education. And you can find that on the UH Hilo website. And it's just four weeks that uh, correspond to the election, and uh, it'll be a lot of fun. And if that is difficult to find, we will have it posted on our website also. Fantastic. And possibly with a little bit more information about your department than you, if you'd like. Great. To. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, sir. Thank you very much. Appreciate it very much. Great talking to you. Thank you for being involved. Thank you for listening. Thank you for voting. Please think. God bless. Aloha. Aloha. We also have special convention coverage coming up soon. Stay with us. Information about Professor Belt's class and Occupy Hawaii events are coming up shortly. We will resume producing shows daily, Monday through Friday, in October for the run-up to the election. Thanks for watching. In 1913, the money power of the country was taken away from the people, but it was given up in the Federal Reserve Act. The Federal Reserve is no more federal than Federal Express. Ba 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 ma. You try a high down, you sure a freedom ma. You seek a gender, we know you know you anti-American. You come poverty American constitution. 1913, corrupt in the system. Devalue dollar, hyperinflation. The Federal Reserve, controlled by Lucifer. <laughs> he can't see you lying. Hallelujah. No matter what we try hide on, he know your motor from the reason. You headed to a place more hotter than a sun, sun, cinnamon, dun, 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 dun. Uncorruptible.
civilization. Two thousand years ago, we can't just smoke a van. We no surprise what you try to do. Fulfill prophecy, I return 'cause I know.